Hello, welcome to 12 Questions with David Howell. My name is Kirsten Jomik. I am an Associate Professor of History at Adelphi University in New York. Last year was the first time we did the 12 question series. And for those that were able to join us then, I think many would agree it was a lot of fun to listen to Professor Laura Hine, who is the volume three editor, as well as the general editor of the three volume series of the new Cambridge History of Japan, give us her thoughts, not only about editing volume three, but to hear how the field of modern Japanese history writing has changed over time. So a note on the format of tonight's events. After brief introductions, uh, Professor Wiegand will interview Professor Howell for about 50 minutes or so, and then afterwards we'll turn to audience Q&A. During the Q&A time and only during that time, please use the raise the hand function to indicate you would like to ask a question. And when I call on you, please state your name and then your question. You can also type your question into the chat. I know everyone is looking forward to a very lively discussion, so we'll make sure we leave enough time for that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a link to the table of contents to volume two in the chat. So now to the introductions. And I promise both um, Karin and David, I would reduce my introduction, so I'm gonna reduce it. Um, for, all, for the people everyone is here for, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Karin Wiegand, the Francis and Charles Field Professor in History at Stanford University. Professor Wiegand received her PhD from UC Berkeley and has a wide range of interests and is a geographer by training. So I promised just one book. So I will do her first book, The Making of a Japanese Periphery, 1750 to 1920. But I would also like to mention that she does a lot of collaborative work with many um, world historians really going beyond the field of Japan and discipline. And her current project is of editing a volume of transnational interdisciplinary essays for the University of Chicago Press called Territorial Imaginaries, Beyond the Sovereign Map, due to be published next year. Next, we have David Howell, who is the Robert K. and Dale J. Weary Professor of Japanese History at Harvard University. Professor Howell received his PhD from Princeton University. His first book, Capitalism from Within, Economy, Society, and the State in a Japanese Fishery from UC Press. Numerous articles and chapters in both Japanese and English. I think many of us um, still go back to these articles, foundational in shaping our way of thinking about the social political history of Tokugawa. And if I can briefly just mention personal favorites, um, the girl with the horse dung hairdo, um, in looking modern East Asian visual culture from the treaty ports to World War II, making useful citizens of Ainu subjects in early 20th century Japan in Journal of Asian Studies, and the social life of firearms um, in Tokugawa, Japan um, in Japanese studies. He's currently finishing a short narrative about the Meiji Restoration period. He describes it as the B-side of mid 19th century history that is to focus on the social history of the countryside more than on the central politics and diplomacy, although he does give attention to those matters as well. Okay, so now without any further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Professor Wiegand. Wonderful, thank you. We've got 12 questions in about 48 minutes, so I'm just gonna start shooting. Um, let's start with your title, David. Yes. Periodization is a question of time as well as space. And this book purports to give us the history of Japan, early modern Japan in Asia and the world. And I, we've already had a little bit of back and forth about early modern Japan, I'd say off and on for the last 20 years, but I thought it was a very interesting choice. And I wanted to hear you talk about it a little bit, especially um, in light of the criticisms that some of our friends have lobbied against any use of the term early modern in, on the grounds that it presumes, or at least implies, a stage theory of history and a gradual transition into the modern. I rather like the way Hansen Shung, one of your contributors, spins it. And I just want to share, I wrote out his words today because I thought this was a good way to launch our conversation about it. The early modernity of the Tokugawa period was, in its latter stages, he says, although I think this is true from the 1590s, 
part and parcel of an emerging condition of global modernity. Sidestepping the teleology of stadial histories, the global modern can be understood as a process of coordination and conflict between societies as the speed and density of their interdependencies intensified. If that's the way you see early modern, then it is as much as spatial as a temporal concept, but I just wanted to put that out there as a question. Great, thanks. Um, you know, it's hard to top uh, Hansen's characterization uh, of the early modern. Um, personally, um, I do understand the uh, hesitation that some colleagues feel. I mean, early modern sounds like the early part of modernity, and so early modernity must necessarily be succeeded by modernity. Um, but I'm actually, um, I don't think that we need to think of it in teleological terms. Um, I can't put it quite as eloquently as Hansen did, but uh, the idea of growing connections around the world um, is one feature of early modernity that I think makes um, Japan during the Tokugawa period uh, comparable in many ways to other societies around the world. Uh, both in Europe, but also elsewhere in Asia, uh, and perhaps places like the Ottoman Empire as well. Uh, I think using calling Tokugawa Japan really modern rather than just Tokugawa Japan or Edo Japan, in a sense, makes it legible to colleagues outside the field uh, who um, can probably bring to mind a kind of early modern vibe that they understand wherever they work. And I think that that vibe, I don't know if that's uh, really a technical term, but the, the vibe I think does carry over to Japan so that they will sort of get it uh, about uh, so many features of the Tokugawa state are, that are quite different from the medieval period that preceded it and uh, also quite different from the modern era that succeeded it. I talk about the terms of periodization a bit in the um, introduction to the volume. I'll just say that um, in the interest of time, I'll just say that I'm comfortable with the idea of multiple early modernities around the world, each uh, sort of similar, but different, uh, developing uh, in some connection, but also independently. Uh, but then I tend to see modernity as a kind of universal hegemonic, um, unavoidable thing. So not every place before modernity had an early modern period, but uh, no one can opt out of modernity. All right, there's lots to follow up on there, but I'm gonna move on. Um, the overall structure of the book yep. looks familiar. It more or less conforms to a pattern that Beth Berry critiqued in the original Cambridge History of Japan, leading with politics, then going to the economy, then society and culture. But as I look, at the way the actual contents of those sections and people I understand can be looking at this themselves if they want to in the chat. In the first section, we also have political thought and philosophy with a strong argument by Federico Marcon that we have Tokugawa philosophy as a better category than Tokugawa thought. Um, in the second section on economy, there's a very novel kind of emphasis on environment, science and technology that I don't think was there 30 years ago. And in the social practices and cultures, there's just been an explosion of new perspectives. I think that makes this in some ways the a very fresh part of the book. I won't say the freshest because it's, it's everywhere, but we have not just sort of religion and urbanization and protest, which would have been themes in the 90s, but medicine, print culture, labor, the status order and the status of the peripheries of Japan. So I wondered if you had any reflections after having set it up this way and organized the essays this way on the, the structure of the volume. Yeah, um, part of the overall structure was a response to the charge that Cambridge University Press gave us um, and their understanding of what a Cambridge history should do and what it, how it should look and what it should look like, uh, which is a, a, a when we were originally agreeing to do these volumes in, in negotiations with the press, uh, I think all three of us said that it sounded rather old fashioned to us um, and that certainly for Tokugawa politics, um, you know, uh, Ieyasu's reign, Hidetada's reign, Iemitsu's reign, and so on. That kind of chapter, you know, might have been interesting in its way, but it's certainly not the kind of thing I could easily have commissioned anyone to write. Um, uh, so we tried, we sort of balked a little bit 
um, but still tried to accommodate as much as possible, uh, having a kind of political through line, political history through line uh, through the volume. Uh, but as you say, we don't really have um, the kind of traditional shogunal reigns or um, even in you know castle politics kinds of chapters because you know not that many people do that kind of work uh in the anglophone world it's not i don't think it's a big concern of readers of the cambridge history of japan at least uh so we tried to sort of accommodate while also going in our own direction um, and i thought you know it, it worked out pretty well um carry paramore's you know focus on politics and political thought um and policy, and that's a, in some ways the closest thing to that kind of narrative that we have in the book, um, juxtaposed with Federico's um, sort of manifesto in favor of looking at uh, what um, I dare not any longer call Tokugawa intellectual history as uh, Tokugawa philosophy. Right. Yeah. Um, we'll get back to some of those issues, I think, later on. But I also wanted to note that gender was deliberately integrated into all of the chapters. That was the mandate, I believe, that you gave to your authors, as was true, we heard from Laura Hine for the series as a whole. And I thought that was uh, a good move. It's all over the essays. It's well represented in the index. Um, and I, again, wanted to just give you a chance to reflect on that, whether you thought there were opportunities to have gone even farther. Would you do this again? Yeah, I think... Uh... I certainly think it was a good idea. Uh, we were all afraid that if we had a kind of you know, gender chapter, that uh, the issue of gender and you know women in general, alas, would be sort of relegated to their one chapter. And um, we could say, oh, we gave you a chapter, you should be happy now. And that didn't seem like a very satisfying way to go. So integrating as much as possible into every chapter. Um, I think if you read through the chapters, you'll see that some authors did a really good job of that, um, others less so. You know, some topics were more amenable to uh, talking about uh, women and men as women and men uh, as actors um, than the more institutional types of chapters. Uh, but everyone gave it a go, at least. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm, I know that there's more that um, we could have done, certainly more that I could have done. Um, especially in my chapter on, you know, sort of the institutional structure of the Tokugawa state, which, you know, a lot of it was just sort of going through the different flavors of, of domains and so on. But uh, I know that there were opportunities there that I didn't pursue or might not have, you know, opportunities well, I don't know. A couple, about, a couple of ways it did come in that I, in the, even in part one, in the political part that struck me were uh, Morgan Patelka talking about different flavors of masculinity among yeah. the early shoguns yeah and that was really interesting and then the the chart of the actual organization of the shogunate that now includes the ooku yes as, yeah. as an institution and organ in its own right these are yeah. these are major contributions i think some somebody who's not as familiar with the field might not recognize it might not jump out at them as much but but it did kind of pop out at me well, well I'm, I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah. yeah um there are three particular concepts that i kind of put in my notes and quotes that I wanted to give you a chance to expound on or us to discuss a little more. One comes up very fleetingly in your essay on regional authority, and that is the notion of the garrison state, which I yep. believe you um, ascribe to Takagi Shosaku, whose work I haven't read. Yep. And you say it's his coinage as Heiei Kokka in Japanese to capture, quote, the logic of military preparedness that underlay all institutions during the Tokugawa period. Yeah. This was a new concept for me reading this volume, or at least it wasn't until reading this that I really, it really got an anchor in my head. And you, in a footnote, give Maren Ellers credit for bringing it to the field. And then I realized it's everywhere in her essay. It is really the way she describes the Tokugawa state. And um, in her wonderful chapter on status, let me just give you a short quote of how she, one place where she applies this. Ellers points out that when the Meiji government in 1872 gave up the cumbersome status system, which had originally taken shape precisely within this kind of logic of military preparedness, that's the Meiji state encountered relatively little resistance because the framework of the garrison state had already been so weakened by various workarounds and substitutions. 
during the long years of peace. So it's a, yeah. a concept that kind of fits in with the notion of the great peace, which is a, another phrase that's been picked up by some of our colleagues. But I thought it deserved a little more um, underscoring yeah. because it's a, a relatively new way to characterize this this compound state or whatever we want to call it. So do you, tell yeah. me more. Yeah, so, um, you know, first, um, as you suggested, you know, full credit to Marin for picking up on that uh, coinage from Takagi Shosaku, and um, and then I saw it in Marin's work and thought this is exactly the concept that I was trying to reach for in my own mind, but hadn't quite come up with. Um, and so I hope that it becomes a more popular way of characterizing the Tokugawa state in the future. And the way I see it, um, or the, the way that I see the development of Tokugawa institutions is that, um, you know, like the status system itself was not a conscious creation. There was no status system committee that sort of drew up, okay, we're going to have samurai, we're going to have commoners, et cetera. But they're more rather sort of organic units that developed um, uh, through the building of institutions in the early seven, early through mid 17th centuries. Um, and the early through mid 17th centuries was a time when the Tokugawa state was extremely worried about warfare and about its own security and securing its own succession. Uh, and so the idea that um, not only warriors, but uh, commoners of all sorts who uh, tilled the fields and provided um, you know, merchandise or artisanal wares, uh, or even outcasts who did um, uh, work um, on behalf of the state, were all somehow contributing to the military preparedness of the state. And then so institutions then form on that basis and eventually get uh, sort of codified uh, into the Tokugawa status system. You know, after a while, warfare and actual military preparedness become less pressing. But you know, institutions retain their fundamental logic. You know, the samurai class was a military class after all, and men walked around heavily armed as a symbol of their warrior status, even if they didn't actually ever fight in any kind of war. Um, and you know, as Marin says, um, once the regime collapsed, um, I mean, it collapsed in part because the logic of the garrison state no longer worked. And so it's not a coincidence, I think, that the status system itself just came apart at the seams. So there was no way to keep the status system without the logic um, of providing military service to the now defunct Tokugawa shogunate. In, in my undergraduate teaching, I liken it um, to the US internet, uh, not internet, the um, interstate freeway system, which I think the technical name is the Eisenhower National Defense Highway System, developed after World War II, um, in the first instance, to get men and materiel for military preparedness from one part of the country to the other. But, you know, when tanks don't need to use the freeways, then people can use the freeways. Uh, and so it's part of the American post-war, Cold War garrison state, but you wouldn't think it as you're stuck in traffic on the on the 10 or the 95 or whatever it is that you're stuck in. Yeah, yeah that's good. Uh, Mara, and also points out that it became the, the vehicle through which commoners could make claims on the state, that they create mm -hmm. an organization that gets acknowledged because of the service it performs, and then they can make claims, and then they can also galvanize those networks for protest. So yes. it, it, I, there may have been other motivations for the state to get rid of it. Um, it, it, it occurs to me. So a second fundamental concept that pervades the book is Luke Roberts' notion of performing the great peace, the yep. notion of government through performance. Yep. And this, um, I think it pops up in so many different ways. It's sometimes rendered as superficial compliance or a charade of obedience. Um, I understand Fabian Drixler elsewhere calls it a regime of facade fictions, but we see it in the status on, in the essay on status, people yep. are performing their, their status. Uh, we see it in the, chapter on ethnicity, where the Ainu are simulating their own difference, simulating dissimulation, right? Um, we see it in diplomacy with the Ryukyu Islanders posing as independent of Japan when they act, interact with the Qing, but everybody knows what's going on is the key, right? Yep. These are 
These are simulations that, that are, are fairly transparent. And so it struck me that even though Luke didn't personally have a chapter with his name on it in the volume, um, his contribution ends up being uh, pervading the book because it has pervaded the field. And again, I wondered, I, I set this off against the concept of the industrious revolution, which actually Kiri Paramore flags as probably the single most successful export that the early modern Japan history field has ever given to the rest of the field. It's been taken up at least by early modern Europeans. And Kiri Paramore within the context of ethical thinking, mor moral economy, does very interesting things with the Industrious Revolution, but nobody else in, in this particular iteration of the Cambridge history is really using that one. Instead, they're talking about performance. Yeah. Well, it's certainly true that, um, you know, I don't think, I, I think specialists knew about the performative aspect of a lot of Tokugawa politics and um, sort of interactions um, before Luke wrote his book, but he did such a wonderful job of conceptualizing it and um, and then showing it in practice through like really um, striking and memorable examples. I mean, the opening case where um, an actor pretending to be a sick daimyo, you know, is naming an heir um, to a shogunal official who knows it's all a charade, but accepts it because the cost for everyone of not accepting would just be too high. Um, and even that characterization, I mean, the whole story is, is much more complicated. So if there's anyone out there who has not read Performing the Great Piece, uh, I heartily recommend it. And so I think it is safe to say that within the field, Luke's book has been the most influential of the past. Um, and the book came out, it's been a while now, more than 10 years, I think, uh, uh, of that period. Um, because it does um, provide a kind of framework for us to think about um, how politics in real life worked. Um, and the, I mean, for me, that's one of the interesting things about the Tokugawa period, that element of performance, um, the, the wink, wink, nudge, nudge world of the, of the Tokugawa, where everyone knows that it's all, uh, a show, but, um, the show makes sense, uh, in a way that, um, truth or reality wouldn't, wouldn't work, um, so um, I think it has been uh, very good in the field. Luke, you know, for, I've never asked him about it, but for whatever reasons, he didn't frame it um, as a universal book about the way early modern states make do with uh, very small ruling classes and uh, very difficult means of communication and knowing what's you know what's really going on in their realms. Uh, I think if he had had that ambition and tweaked it a bit uh, and maybe used um, in, cooked up some English terms rather than um, omote and, and naisho and, and Japanese words like that, he could have made uh, a kind of impact outside the field, but because he, you know, it's a wonderful book, um, but he chose to make it a, a book about Jap Japan exclusively, then it may not um be as well known outside the field as it ought to be. Because I think, you know, anyone who reads it, who works in the early modern period, will see lots of uh, resonances with their own fields. Um, right. Industrious Revolution, on the other hand, you know, it's catchy. Um, and for, you know, kind of economic historians and um, and Hayami Akira, who coined the, the phrase, you know, is a demographer and economic historian. And it has had a life beyond Japan. Kind of, I don't know, Jan de Vries took it up and it takes him a long time to eventually in a footnote notice that Hayami Akira had actually used the phrase before he did. But that's a that's a different fight for another another um, web event, I think. Yeah. OK, the last um, concept that I wanted to highlight is one that actually appears in only one essay, but it really grabbed me. And that is, again, from Hansung Shung. Trans-Imperial Educational Commons. All right, that's a mouthful. Um, but again, I, let, me, let me give his definition. Japanese were aware that the European language texts made available to them were the product of global changes in a connected educational landscape. Putatively Western knowledge was forged in the Trans-Imperial Educational Commons, one that involved the porting of resources across American, British, Dutch, and Qing networks in the Pacific. 
And then after the Opium War, he goes on to say that this expands from beyond Batavia, which is one of its primary nodes, and, and Nanjing probably, to include Hong Kong, Ningbo, Shanghai. These all become hubs for educational initiatives by various colonial and would-be would be colonial powers. And then he says we should even include semi-colonial and crypto-colonial spaces like Egypt and Ottoman Lebanon and Siam within the larger kind of canvas or landscape of places that are um, actively looking to each other for models and kind of piggybacking on each other's and borrowing each other's texts. He says there's common right, not copyright for the, the yeah. works that were produced within this educational um, network of exchange. I found that really exciting and just, again, wanted to underscore it for, for everybody here and see if you had, as you seem to always do, a further kind of light to shed. Yeah, well, I I agree that it's a, a very um, nice and fresh way of thinking about not just uh, the spread of educational material or of, even of knowledge per se, but uh, just I mean, as we were chatting a little bit before this event began, just switching nation or national for imperial actually makes so much more sense because um, these are not modern nation states, but rather you know the British Empire and the Qing Empire and the Dutch Empire and the commercial empire. Um, and information and goods and people and ideas are are using each of those empires' imperial networks. To eventually get things to Japan, and um, you know, it's different from it's certainly different from the kind of um, you know Britain straight to Japan or the Netherlands straight to Japan or China straight to Japan vision of the kind of um, early modern exchanges that that we may have had, and I, I certainly think that one of the things that this volume does um, that thirty years ago was just not possible not yet imagined was to really complicate this idea of Japan's interactions with you know, the West. Uh, uh, Hansen, it's not in his chapter, but he wrote uh, a separate article uh, about a textbook that was originally produced in Britain for the education of deaf children in York or somewhere in Yorkshire. And then that textbook made its way to China, where it was adapted by British missionaries um, as a way of um, teaching Chinese children um, and then translated it into Chinese where it ended up in Japan used as a textbook for vernacular Chinese. That So a, a book originally written for deaf children in, in Yorkshire ends up being a textbook for how to speak modern Chinese in um, Japan um, in the 1850s. Or 1860s. Uh, it's okay. just point you know, made. Yeah. I think it's partly the payoff too of um, the really strong focus now on the books as material objects and the printing presses and the markets and the circulate the networks within which they circulate that really has brought to the fore the role of these hubs that are outside of Europe proper or even outside of China. But within which, and as long as we're saying trans-imperial, I think some people in this room, in this Zoom room, have really pushed back our gates for thinking about Japan itself as an empire or a would-be empire. So when you wonder what to call Japan during the Tokugawa period, that might not be a bad handle either. Yeah. Okay, very quickly, I don't know how much time we have. I There were four other themes. Maybe I'll just put them all out and let you pick and choose. Um, that I saw that popped out for me among the uh, within the chapters. One is the pervasiveness of debate, argument, disagreement, litigiousness, protest, all the whole the whole gamut. Um, in the intellectual history essays, we get a very strong sense that what we've thought of as schools of thought are actually not only div diffuse and dispersed, but they, they don't even almost exist. There's some of them are so loose. Medical schools, for instance, Susan Burns tells us, these weren't really schools. People would study with one person then write a tract based in another tradition and their shingle outside their practice might be yet another. Similarly, people within schools of thought of a, like, of a different kind within Confucianism, you could study with a teacher and then argue back against the teacher or argue against his other disciples. 
Uh, so the, a very lively landscape of debate. That was certainly one of the things that came across. And I loved um, Carrie Paramore's characterization of Chu Shi Fa as functioning like Aristotelianism, in other words, as creating a matrix for debate and a grounds for considering evidence rather than imposing an orthodoxy on what people think. I think that was a that's a very strong, useful characterization of this period. Okay, a second theme I saw is the 1660s as a turning point. This pops up in so many different essays, in the essay on medicine, on international trade, which I'm more familiar with, um, in the political order settling down, religions consolidating, the status order kind of falling into place, Neo-Confucianism becoming institutionalized. And it's even roughly the same time as Shakushain's war, so the integration yep. of, of the Ainu into, into Japan. Yeah, I thought that was pretty interesting and significant. Something that really, I hadn't realized how many registers it, that that turning point really mattered in. To a lesser extent, I think the 1780s begin to show up, maybe more visibly than they did in the earlier iteration of the Cambridge history, because the the two volumes divided at 1800. Yes. Right, we yeah. had a 19th century and an early modern volume that divided 1800. So the the decades right around that turning point were, in some ways, oddly less visible. Um, finally, of the themes in the book that <laughs> popped out to me, no surprise, geography. The sophistication of spatial thinking now really does, uh, it's very impressive. And I, having recently reread Henry Smith's review of the 19th century volume, which he critiques for being gently for being overly focused on the center and says, well, in time it will come. We will get the regional dif differentiation. Wow, was that prescient. It feels like we really, we have it everywhere. Kind of the economy itself is being reimagined in terms of natural resources that are distributed very unevenly around the country. Um, we're looking at tectonic forces. We're really doing subtle work, it seems to me, on the differences between Osaka and its hinterland and Edo and its hinterland. So at, at every scale, in every way, it felt like spatially that there was a, a there had been a real spatial turn in the field. So yeah. I'll throw all of those out. And then I also wondered whether there were any other themes that were on your mind that you would have loved to see even more. I mean, it's already a feast, but it, were there other themes that you would have liked to see develop? Yeah, um, I, thank you. Um, I think, um, the things that you highlighted are all things that I would recognize and to some extent, well, certainly welcomed. Um, I, I, I won't say that I engineered them, but um, I was very happy to see them. Um, you know, I think the idea that there was no like state imposed orthodoxy, there's no examination system, uh, that sort of thing. We've all always known about the Tokugawa state, but I think the essays um, that talk about all the the diversity and the lack of uniformity among the different intellectual streams um, really, I think, um, do a great job in just showing how messy, but but therefore really fascinating, uh, the world of thought and culture, the freedom that people had uh, to study, you know, if they had the, the resources at least to study what they wanted, uh, it sounds like with you know with whom they wanted without too much constraint um, if they could just afford it. Um, sixteen sixty, yeah, that's um, in my own teaching. I always say sixteen sixty is about the time that the Tokugawa state fully matured, and we can really talk about the you know the high Tokugawa period or the the mature Tokugawa period. Um, and one of the problems about doing Tokugawa history is that you know it goes on for you know, two hundred and. 65 years, uh, give or take. Um, and we often speak of it as a kind of uniform block, um, but actually it was a period of great change. And so it took a while um, to get the institutions of the early modern state in order um, the, through the first three shoguns in particular um, and to sort of get everything settled down. And it really did. Um, also, you know, by 1660, um, the, there's still worries about you know, the Manchus may be invading Japan, you know, the way that the Mongols had done centuries before. But um, you know, Japan's situation within East Asia is sort of calming down and becoming clearer um, and um, just institutions in general. Uh, so 
I hope that that become helps that the volume helps make 1660 or so, give or take, a kind of um, commonsensical starting point for talking about the mature Tokugawa period. Um, and space, yeah, I think, um, I mean, I, I certainly give you a lot of credit as a as an evangelist for spatial thinking and, and the geographical consciousness. But it's also true that, um, you know, the, the days when so much work was just focused uh, not on Edo or Osaka per se, but rather on on thinkers or policymakers who were in either the commercial capital or the political capital. Um, I think those days have passed. I mean, there's a lot of good work to be done uh, looking at things from the center, but um, maybe I have Marin looking at a kind of middle-sized domain in Fukui, of what, you know, what's now Fukui of all places. Um, my own vision has always been sort of drawn to the peripheries for a reason. I don't know why, but that's, uh, I always end up doing that. Um, and then other people looking at other parts of the country. So, um, and then putting the environment into the story. Um, of course, Brett Walker's chapter is all about environment and climate and things like that. But I think um, kind of like gender, I think uh, many of the chapters just um, have internalized an environmental consciousness, which then connects to a spatial consciousness. Um, yeah, I uh, can't remember what the last one was. Well, the actually, the last one was open-ended. And you and I oh, have right. yes. this a Thank little you. bit in advance that yeah. I noticed a, a, a weak stream of deep underground yeah. on slavery, which yes. comes in both in the forms of labor and race and international yes. relations, inter-imperial relations yes. because of the movement of people. So I that seems like a very interesting frontier, potentially. Yeah. Um, I, you know, one of my hobbies is editing the Harvard Journal of Asiatic Studies, and I um, commissioned a special issue on slavery in early modern East Asia and Southeast Asia and Inner Asia, as it turned out. Um, and in that um, special issue, has about 10, 10 chapters or so. Um, I didn't, um, as editor, I didn't try to impose a particular definition of slavery on the contributors and sort of left it to them to say what they meant by slavery. Um, and that really opened up a lot of room for interesting thinking about uh, all sorts of unfree labor or people who are, you know, bound in um you know relationships like um hereditary servants so not not chattel and who can be bought and sold exactly but certainly not free agents who can do whatever they want uh unfortunately the we didn't have a chapter that focused on the the main part of the tokugawa period per se as it turned out uh maybe that was a missed opportunity i think it would be really interesting um maybe for the uh, 2050 version of the, the the newer Cambridge history of Japan uh, by that time, maybe looking at back at labor and, and free labor and um, slavery in a kind of capacious sense would be a theme. Um, in some ways, it'd be kind of a retro theme because in the 1950s, um, you know, people like um, Araki Moriaki you know, were writing about um, serfdom and other kinds of um, bounded bound labor uh, in the Tokugawa period, you know, within a kind of Marxist framework, and then that got sort of shunted off uh, to the side. Um, and you know, thinking about unfree labor, free labor, um, labor markets, uh, in a way that includes uh, the concept of slavery might be actually a very good next step for us as a field. Okay, well, we probably have a few minutes here at the end. Um, I want, wondered if you might want to reflect a little bit about the moment that we are in and in which this particular iteration of a kind of state of the field summation appears. Um, it's, it's fun for the field and useful, I think, yeah. that you were also, as I understand it, a research assistant for the previous version, the original Cambridge History of Japan. So you really have been involved in both of these in a, in a way very few of us have. Yeah. Um, and there are just a couple things that, as I started thinking about the question of where are we now, 
um, just within the last five years, some pretty interesting big think kind of meta think things have happened. One is because of the anniversary of the Meiji Restoration, the 150th anniversary, we have several new books on reconsidering the Meiji Restoration in global history. And that's really kind of the, the end point for this volume and certainly one of the destinations, I think, mm -hmm. of, of one of the telos that people are thinking about as, as they wrote their chapter, we're thinking about as they wrote their chapters. We've also had the marvelous Meiji at 150 podcast series, which yeah. I've been recommending to everybody, students and, and lay people alike, which is a really remarkable repository of interviews of a kind that we didn't have in the field before. Right. Um, the, the massive volume, The Tokugawa World, has recently come out. What I don't even know how many chapters that has. Two yeah. or three times as many as this one, right? 60 plus, um, a state of the field summation. And then most recently, the release of the remarkable memoir trove from the Association for Asian Studies, Trailblazing Women in Japanese Studies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, people really reflecting, women reflecting back on their careers and so many uh, vivid, interesting memoirs that really are rewriting the history of our field, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and at the same time, we have new media and new platforms like the one we're on right now. Yep. The Modern Japan History Association really is a new kind of networking hub that I think makes conversations possible in a, in a new form and in a more inclusive way. One of the, maybe the best gift fallout from COVID is that we all yep. know how to Zoom now yep. and we're, we're all ready to go with that. But then we also have other kinds of digital resources, AI search tools, digital history labs, spatial history labs. The field is is moving, I think, technologically taking advantage of new possibilities at the moment. Yeah. And I just wonder if it's your sense that the, Cambridge, the new Cambridge History of Japan is coming out at some kind of a watershed moment in the field. Yeah, oh. uh, interesting. I Well, I, I should say in all honesty that it's coming out now because um, the editors at Cambridge University Press thought it was time for a new edition for, they didn't confide in me and why they thought now would be a good time for a new edition. Um, certainly in the process of putting together this volume, like looking back over the older versions of the Cambridge History of Japan, um, I could see that how much the field had moved on in the last 30 or 40 years. Um, and so in that sense, it really was time. Um, but as you say, um, well, no, let me, let me just finish uh, this thought that um, in the old version, you know, I, I was, I didn't have much to do with, I was uh, like a, a clerical helper uh, with volume five of the old version, the 19th century volume. Uh, and my dissertation advisor was Marius Jensen, who was one of the general editors of the, of the whole series, but also the volume editor of it, volume five. And, you know, it was still the age of the founding fathers for the most part in the late eighties. Um, and um, they had the confidence, I think, um, with hubris maybe of sort of pronouncing this is this is what you need to know about Japan in the 19th century or about Japan in the really modern period, a kind of authority. Um, you know, there weren't so many people in the field and it was, you know, these guys at, you know, Princeton and Harvard and Yale and places like that who um, sort of decided that they were empowered to do that. Uh, and, you know, they had a, a, a kind of magisterial tone. I mean, it has its advantages um, if you're not sure what to believe, they say, well, we'll tell you what you should believe and or what you should think. Um, and so certainly, um, you know, in the sense that that kind of um, authority um, is increasingly drawn into question and that the field is much more diverse and many more people are working on it uh, and not everybody um, is a founding father. <laughs> Other, um, uh, no more founding fathers. Uh, that um, it's good to have you know more voices and more perspectives uh, and more feedback. So I think uh, the idea that the the old idea that the Cambridge History of Japan will tell you what you really need to know about Japanese history um, has passed. So I say this is one version or you know twenty versions, um, however many chapters there are. 
um, and that other contributors and other editors might have come up with very different sounding or looking versions. Um, the choice of individual topics and it's partly me thinking about what I thought would be interesting. Partly me also thinking about who I knew who might be talked into writing a chapter. Um, partly me in conversation with Laura Hine and Tomi Tonomura, the other editors, about you know, what we wanted the volumes to look like. Um, I think um, in that sense, I think it's um, a, a different kind of, you know, maybe I, I hope it comes across as a somewhat more modest uh, version of modest and not um, not claiming a kind of authority to speak for the whole field. Um, and then the, the bit about, you know, just media changing, um, you know, we have 114 people from all over the place tuning in to this. And thank you all for taking the time to to join us. Um, you know, that's just impossible um, just a few years ago. So yes, as you say, it's like one of the, the few benefits of the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, different perspectives, different voices, I think is good. And that, that if this volume can start a conversation, that's great. And then the, the multimedia aspects. I mean, no one working on Tokugawa Japan has any excuse not to have great images and illustrations. Unless you're on the Cambridge History of Japan, they don't let you have too many images or illustrations. But um, just the way that uh, colleagues and you know, my students you know, bring in visual materials, not just as, as nice pictures to illustrate, but rather to as sources to work through. Um, and then of course, you and many others using maps and other types of materials like that as sources. Uh, so going beyond just the, the usual textual um, sources. And certainly that's got to um, only increase in the future. And since we do have such charismatic images, I think um, the field should be in good shape in that sense. Nice. Kirsten, do I have time for one more question? I mean, I can, we can let it go or? Um, yes, I think we do. We actually did an excellent job of going through them. Yeah, so I think one more question and then uh, we'll open up to Q&A. So if you are thinking of a question, you can start thinking now. Um, go ahead, yeah, Karen. So I'm pushing you a little bit to think sure. forward, which is not, not our specialty. But as I mentioned to you earlier today, I was recently at a, a gathering of Japan scholars from all over the country where the notion from the social scientists in the room, the notion that Japan as model developer has long gone, but we may yet be able to look at Japan as harbinger of the crises that everybody's going to be facing sooner or yeah. later, and that that may be then a new way to think about the importance of studying Japan, to think about our condition, global modernity through Japan, I thought was a very compelling one. And it actually, something came over the transom from HNET just today, um, a conference paper on, I think by Susan Napier, on how Japanese anime does a better job than American Disney style cartoons of kind of capturing the zeitgeist, maybe mm. partly because they're a step farther into this precarious new brave new world that we're mm. that we're all moving toward. So yeah. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to play grand old man and and look forward as well as backward for a second. Yeah. Um, well, I know that it it drives maybe it drives me crazy, but I know it drives other colleagues crazy. Um, when sometimes people will say that that Tokugawa Japan was postmodern before it was modern, um, because of the way that people played, you know, the the, so the culture of play and playing with ideas and and concepts. Um, I'm not sure how far that would go, but I think as a way of um, you know now that we've sort of hopefully given up on you know the teleology of modernization Western styles being the reason that one should study Tokugawa Japan, then seeing um, the ways that people in uh, early modern Japan um, found solutions or responses to issues of concern to them. Um, I don't know if it's a, a model for the future, but it is a model for thinking about the past in a way that isn't so um, beholden to 
you know, kind of narratives of of industrialization or imperialism, you know, Western style imperialism, a different kind of model. Um, you have to be careful not to become too essentialist or the kind of Edo um, echo paradise uh, stuff, which is, can often be kind of nonsensical. Uh, but, you know, maybe a different way of looking at the past does offer a different way of looking at the future. And by talking about connections, the early modern connections of the early modern world and sort of de-exoticizing Tokugawa Japan in a way it does make it available. You know, kind of the way that, I mean, 30 years ago, I would never have imagined that manga and anime would make it across the Pacific the way they have. So um, never say never, I think.